But I'll say one thing. The church has never been this quiet at a 10 a.m. mass. That is uh, for sure. I'm guessing it's not as quiet in your house right now, especially if there's young ones, but uh, it's the best that we can do, right? And, uh, and I think it's important we focus once again this week uh, on the scriptures, and I'll tie in kind of current events at, at the end as well. But what a beautiful scripture passage we have uh, this morning. Once again this week and in year A, we take from the gospel of, of John. And so it's John chapter 9. As you can tell, it's all of chapter 9. It's the whole chapter, verses 1 through 42. And it is the uh, story, um, the miracle of the healing of this blind man. We don't know his name, but the amazing thing is we're able to follow his journey, not just with this physical healing, but the spiritual awakening as well, and the spiritual ability uh, to see, to see God for who he is. At the end, he's able to say, I, I believe, Lord, I believe, and he, and he worshiped him. And it's actually this man who, who Jesus says is, is put in place so that what? So that the works of God might be made visible through him. Remember, it's his disciples who asked Jesus about this blind man. Was it his sin or his parents' sin who caused him to become blind? And Jesus says, neither. And that's important to remember as well, for just in our own uh, circumstances, when we have a, a suffering or whatever else it may be, it's, it's usually not a sin of ours that bring it on, uh, but or, original sin and the problem of evil as well. But as we, we look at the healing of this man, it's important to know just right away something amazing is happening. Jesus spits on the ground uh, and takes this, this clay made from his saliva and places it on the man's eyes. Imagine doing that today. I think uh, we'd be running away, and I know if I tried doing that, I'd definitely get a call from, from the archbishop, uh, and rightly so, and CDC uh, as well. And yet, why does, why does Jesus do this? Because even back then, this would be unclean as well. It's not, it's not an everyday occurrence that this would happen. So why is Jesus doing this? Well, we go back to the beginning of, of time. We go back to Genesis. And we hear about the forming of Adam out of what? The first man out of clay. And it's believed that when, when, when God made this clay, he, he spat on the dust and made this clay uh, to make Adam. And so as we see Jesus spitting on this dust, this spittle, and putting this on this man's eyes, we can see already this correlation between Adam and, and this blind man and this new man, this new creation, which is happening and giving him what? One of the most vital things out there. Giving him this physical sight. But it's not just the placing of the clay on his eyes, but then he sends him as well to the pool of Siloam. And at the pool of Siloam, uh, he goes ahead and we can see in our own mind, we can make this correlation with that of baptism, right? Being washed clean uh, in baptism in this water. And so we see this correlation between this blind man and baptism. And this is important to see as well uh, in this season of Lent. We know that catechumens are preparing to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. And that's why this story of the blind man is in here. But not just this physical healing, but this spiritual healing as well. We know that even after this man is, is healed, they ask him, who is he that, that healed you? And he essentially states, I don't know who he is. Remember, it's not this blind man who's crying out, Lord Jesus, heal, heal me, like we have with lepers and other instances. Instead, Jesus uses him to go ahead and kind of show the, the importance uh, of his works that he's going to make visible. And what he's doing is he's revealing his divinity. So this man's own faith journey we see is, is what? I do not know him. And the next time he's questioned, he states what? Well, he is a prophet. And after that, he goes, this is a man who must be sent from God. And that, that's pretty high up there. But at the end, at the end, what does he say? 
It's when Jesus goes to him after he's been kicked out of the synagogue, and, and this for this to happen, you know, his whole social uh, network is essentially being destroyed, being kicked out of the synagogue. This is a huge thing. And so Jesus seeks him out, and he asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, the one who is with you is the one with you is he and he stated what i do believe lord and he worshiped him so it's not only this physical healing of his sight but this spiritual healing as well this the spiritual healing in the sense of now he's able to see god made visible God truly revealing his divinity in how he worships him. This is the same thing that happens for us in, in baptism. In baptism, we have our, our sight restored. You know, so often in baptism, we think, okay, it's just that washing of original sin, which it is. That's very important. But it's not like the stain all of a sudden is being, being washed away. It's not, you know, a little a coffee stain on your shirt that God's like, I'm going to go ahead and take care of that. No, instead... Uh, with, with the washing of the original sin, what's actually doing is it's giving us sight. Sight to see God. It's enlightening us to see the light in the midst of, of darkness. So when Adam and, and Eve sinned, uh, this, this vision of God essentially almost was taken away. But in baptism, we have this vision of God. We're able to acknowledge the divinity of Jesus Christ and to see God working. It's the early church fathers who actually call the sacrament of baptism, uh, the sacrament of illumination, the sacrament of enlightenment. And so we have this illumination, we have this, this enlightenment to see what? To see God. And then when we do this, we're called to walk as children of light. Children of light. We hear about this in our, in our second reading from Ephesians. St. Paul saying, Walk as children of light. Throughout John's gospel, we have this correlation between darkness and light, light and darkness. And Jesus says, I've come to bring light into the world. And so this is what he is doing. Even in our baptism, remember, at our baptism, we receive that, that lighted candle. Uh, parents and godparents, this light has entrusted you to be kept burning brightly. And to hand that on to the child, to hand on this, this faith. And so we're called to walk as children of, of light. We know as well that uh, right now it can seem like a very uh, dark time. There's so many questions. We don't know what tomorrow is going uh, to bring. So everything's changing. You know, what doesn't change is that God is present. That he is with us. And what we're called to do is to abandon ourselves to God and to let our light shine forth. He will never abandon us. And hopefully, we will never abandon him. And so in this time of turmoil, we should take this time to really, really dive deeper into this relationship with God calling to mind that most of us, if not all of us, are baptized Christians. And so we have this light shining inside of us. But what we're called to do is let this light shine even more and to actually build up this light inside of us as well. How do we do this? Well, it's continuing to, to pray, to take some of this free time that we have now and, and to really dive into, into prayer with the Lord, to abandon ourselves to him, to go ahead and you know, dive into the scriptures, to pray the rosary together, as a family, and to do acts of, of charity, simple acts of simply calling a loved one or a neighbor or reaching out to someone that you know is struggling and bringing that light in, into their life and overpowering this darkness with the light of Christ. One of the most beautiful images uh, every year that uh, we're able to see here in the church is at the Easter Vigil. We always start the Easter Vigil uh, with, with a blazing fire. Here at St. John's, it's a really big blazing fire. It's too much sometimes, I think. But anyways, it's this blazing fire, and we have this blessing of, of the fire, which represents the light of Christ. 
And we take the Easter candle, the Paschal candle, and we process it into the dark church. All the lights are off. Sunset has happened. It's almost pitch dark inside of the church. And it's a beautiful image when this light comes into the church. And it's just that one light of the candle, of the Paschal candle. And we hand that light as well, and the priests and the deacons are able to hold a lighted candle and continue to press this in. And then everyone who is a baptized Christian is able to light their candle as well. And when Deacon and I get up here into, uh, into the sanctuary, uh, and before he sings the exalted, we're able to look out in, into the congregation and see everyone with their, with their candle and their faces being, being lit up with this flame. Individually, if there was only one person out there, it would be a very, very small glow. But with everyone here, this glow is overpowering the darkness that was part of the church before. And that's like with God coming into the world as well. The light of God shining brightly. Individually, when we just have one person doing it, it's not going to be that much. But as we can come together, in unique ways, by the way, over the internet, and we come together, this light is going to continue to shine brightly. And what we're called to do is to build up this light even more and to spread it. This world needs God. Maybe that's what this is all about. Abandoning everything else and coming before the Lord and abandoning ourselves before him. And we don't do this alone. But instead, united with the light of Christ, we're able to go out into the darkness and bring the light of Christ into the world.